good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and, and it is indeed a very good morning for a number of reasons. Uh, I'm Hari Vishwanaga. I teach in the English department at Santa Monica College, and uh, uh, I help the Associated Students of Santa Monica College celebrate this very important day, Constitution Day, which this year is on a Sunday, which is why we have these activities the prior week or the following week. Um, and it is really a wonderful opportunity for me to welcome uh, Professor Erwin Chemerensky, about whom uh, more, many of us know and have known his work for a long time. Uh, I have not been in person, uh, but I have read uh, some of his work and have certainly listened to him being interviewed and have always found uh, his remarks very cogent, insightful, thought provoking. Sometimes, was pause, but always thought provoking. So I'm very glad that he is able to join us. The students at Santa Monica College really celebrate the constitution and of course the accompanying documents, uh, the Bill of Rights and the Declar Declaration of Independence, which really enshrine our values and our ideals. And so um, thank you, Professor Chemerinsky for joining us in this very important ritual that we have tried to observe uh, every year on our campus. And I'm very happy to be part of that uh, for the last several years. Um, Professor Chem Chemerinsky is Dean and Jesse H. H. Chopper, Distinguished Professor of Law at the University of California, Berkeley School of Law. Prior to assuming this position, he was the founding Dean of the University of California Irvine School of Law and a professor at Duke Law School, University of Southern California Law School and DePaul Law School, several different parts of the country. He's the author of 15 books, including Constitutional Law and Interpreting the Constitution and over 200 law articles. He frequently argues appellate cases, including in the United States Supreme Court. In 2022, he was the president of the Association of American Law Schools. And I just want to share with you one quotation as a kind of teaser. Um, this is uh, from his book on uh, free speech on campus, which I just finished reading. And in that, uh, Chemerinsky quotes uh, C. Van Woodward, who had to write a report about a controversy that erupted in, at Yale University in the 1970s. The report reiterated that, quote, the university must do everything possible to ensure within it the fullest degree of intellectual freedom, including, quote, the right to think the unthinkable, discuss the unmentionable, and challenge the unchallengeable. Professor Irvin Chemerinsky. Thank you. Thank you so much for the kind introduction. Thank you for inviting me to speak today. I want to talk about the United States Supreme Court. As you mentioned, I have a constitutional law casebook that's used in law schools and some undergraduate classes. I wrote the first edition of it 30 years ago. Over Labor Day weekend, I finished the seventh edition. The seventh edition is more different than any prior edition than any book that I've done. It is dramatic how much constitutional law has changed in just the last couple of years. And that's what I want to talk about today. First, I want to talk about how do we get here? How do we get the current Supreme Court? Second, I want to talk about what animates the court and how constitutional law has changed dramatically, even radically, in the last few years. And the third, I want to look to the future and what we can expect from the Supreme Court. I'll talk until about 12.15 and then be delighted to take about 15 minutes of questions. How did we get to the current court? It's unique in American history because there are six conservative justices, all appointed by Republican presidents, and three liberal justices appointed by Democratic presidents. Until recently, we had liberal justices appointed by Republican presidents, John Paul Stevens, 
David Souter would be examples of that. And we have had conservative justice appointed by Democratic presidents, Byron White, before that, Felix Frankfurter. Now there is a complete correspondence between the political party of the president who made the appointment and the ideology of the justice. I think that heightens the sense of a politicized court. Between 1960 and 2020, there were 32 years with a Republican president and 28 years with a Democratic president. Almost even. In fact, in 2024, we'll have had 32 years with a Republican president and 32 years with a Democratic president. But between 1960 and 2020, Republican presidents picked 15 justices, whereas Democratic presidents picked only eight justices, almost a two to one difference. I can put this for you in a different way. President Donald Trump appointed three justices in his four years in the White House. The prior three Democratic presidents, Jimmy Carter, Bill Clinton, and Barack Obama, served a combined 20 years in the White House. In those 20 years, they picked only four Supreme Court justices. The Republican presidents have tended to pick quite conservative justices. That's certainly been true of the most recent Republican presidents. George W. Bush, Donald Trump. I think they did so to please a political base that looked very much to Supreme Court nominations. And it was a political base that above all wanted the appointment of justices who would overrule Roe versus Wade. For better or worse, there was a litmus test for the Republican presidents. And their litmus test was justices who were going to overrule Roe. It's produced a court that's the most conservative since the 1930s. In fact, when the term ended a year ago, on July 30th, 2022, there was an article the next day in the New York Times where they did a statistical study and their conclusion was that the Supreme Court's term, and here we're talking about the term from a year ago, was the most conservative since 1931. Well. This is how we got to the current court. It involves six justices appointed by Republican presidents, Chief Justice John Roberts, Justice Clarence Thomas, Samuel Alito, Neil Gorsuch, Brett Kavanaugh, and Amy Coney Barrett, who are the conservatives, and Justices Sonia Sotomayor, Elena Kagan, and Ketanji Brown Jackson, who are the liberals. Now let me move to the second part of remarks, which I wanna spend most of my time on, and that talk is about what animates this court. I said as my introduction that there have been dramatic changes in constitutional law. Well, let me explain this by focusing on nine days from the end of June of 2022. And I think that these nine days brought about this dramatic change in constitutional law as we've ever seen in a little over a week in the United States Supreme Court. Let me start with Tuesday, June 21st of 2022. And the Supreme Court decided Carson versus Macon. Comes out of Maine. There are parts of Maine that are too rural to support local public school systems. So in these areas, school administrative units provide funds for parents to send their children to private school. Under the state law, which provides for this, the money can be used for any private school, so long as it is secular. Maine law says it can't be used for, quote, sectarian or religious schools. It's estimated that about 5,000 children a year in Maine benefit from this program. Two families brought a challenge to this, and they said that they wanted to use the money to send their children to religious school. The federal district court and the federal court of appeals ruled against the families. They accepted Maine's argument that the state has put interest in providing a free secular education for all children. They accept the state's interest that it's wrong to tax people to support the religion of others. The United States Supreme Court in a six to three decision reversed and ruled the Maine law unconstitutional 
and restricting the use of funds for religious schools. I'm going to say a lot over the course of the next hour, six to three decision. Chief Justice Roberts wrote for the court, joined by Justice Thomas, Alito, Gorsuch, Kavanaugh, and Barrett. Justice Stephen Breyer and Justice Sonia Sotomayor wrote dissents that Justice Elena Kagan joined. Chief Justice Roberts said, it violates free exercise of religion whenever the government subsidizes secular private education if it's not providing the same funds for religious education. So for Maine to give money for secular private schools, but not for religious schools, violates the Constitution. The idea of a wall separating church and state didn't originate with liberal professors. It was Thomas Jefferson who said that there should be a wall that separates church and state. And he did so in the context of opposing attacks that would have supported a church in Virginia. For decades, the Supreme Court focused on the question of when may the government give aid to religious schools without that being an impermissible establishment of religion. But now the Supreme Court says the question is, when must the government give aid to religious schools or it violates free exercise of religion? Prior to decisions in recent years, never in American history had the Supreme Court said that the government was constitutionally required to subsidize religion. But now that's where the Supreme Court has gone. Two days later, on Thursday, June 23rd, the Supreme Court decided New York State Rifle and Pistol Association versus Bruin. It involved a New York law, initially adopted in 1907, that prohibited having guns in public without a permit. To get a permit, somebody would have to show cause, and this required demonstrating a safety need for a gun in public. California had a very similar law. From 1791, when the Second Amendment was ratified, until June of 2008, not once had the Supreme Court struck down any federal, state, or local gun regulation. Without exception, in the handful of cases about the Second Amendment, the Supreme Court said the Second Amendment means what it says. It's about a right to have guns for militia service. In June 2008, in District Columbia versus Heller, the Supreme Court struck down a DC ordinance that prohibited private ownership, possession of handguns. It was a five to four decision. Justice Anton Scalia wrote the opinion for the court. And he said, the second amendment protects the right of people to have guns in their homes for the sake of security. The Supreme Court didn't return to the scope of the Second Amendment for a dozen years until the Bruin case. The Supreme Court, in a six to three decision, declared the New York law unconstitutional. Justice Clarence Thomas wrote for the court. Justice Stephen Breyer wrote for the dissenters. Justice Thomas said, the Second Amendment protects the right to have guns in public. This includes concealed weapons, the government cannot condition a gun permit on somebody having to show a safety need. But then the Supreme Court went further. Justice Thomas said the only kind of gun regulation should be allowed are those that were historically permitted. Historically means in 1791, when the Second Amendment was ratified. Maybe it includes 1868, when the 14th Amendment was ratified. For all other constitutional rights, the government can act if it has sufficiently important interest. The government can discriminate based on race or infringe free speech if it has a compelling interest and there's no other way to achieve it. But Justice Thomas said that analysis is not to be used for the Second Amendment. It doesn't matter how important the government's end or how necessary the means. The only government regulation of guns that's allowed, that which was historically allowed back in 1791. To see the significance of this and the implications, let me talk about a case that's pending now before the Supreme Court. This can be argued on November 7th. It's a case called United States versus Rahimi. 
there's a federal law that says that if a person is under a restraining or a domestic violence case, they can't have a firearm. This is a law that saved a lot of lives, especially women's lives. Rahimi has long criminal convictions, and then he was under a restraining order in a domestic violence case, and he got caught with guns. And he was convicted under the federal law of having guns, even though he was under a restraining order. The United States Court of Appeals for the Fifth Circuit overturned his conviction. The Fifth Circuit said, the only gun regulations allowed is that which existed in 1791. There were no laws in 1791 that prohibited people from having guns if they were under a restraining order or domestic violence case. So we shouldn't allow that law today. Of course, in 1791, there weren't restraining orders in domestic violence cases. In 1791, there wasn't protection women from domestic violence. In 1791, married women were considered the property, the chattels of their husbands. Married women weren't allowed to enter into contracts or own property. And certainly they didn't have protection from domestic violence. But the Supreme Court said that the only gun regulation allowed is that was historically permitted and the Fifth Circuit declared this law unconstitutional. The Supreme Court has granted a review, as I said. But I think that's the implications of what the Supreme Court said in Bruin. Unless, as I hope, the Supreme Court will allow regulation of guns when there's an overriding important interest. The next day, Friday, June 24th, the Supreme Court decided Dobbs versus Jackson Women's Health Organization. In 1973, in Roe v. Wade, the Supreme Court held that pregnant persons have a constitutional right to choose whether to terminate a pregnancy up to the point of viability, the point at which the fetus can survive outside the womb. In 1992, in Planned Parenthood v. Casey, the Supreme Court reaffirmed Roe v. Wade. Roe was a seven to two decision. It was a decision where the justices in the majority included both Republicans and Democrats. In fact, three of the justices in the majority in Roe had been appointed to the Supreme Court by Republican President Richard Nixon. Justice Harry Blackman, who wrote the opinion, Chief Justice Warren Burger, Justice Lewis Powell. The two dissenters in Roe were Byron White, who had been appointed to the court by President John F. Kennedy, and William Rehnquist was appointed by President Richard Nixon. Even more dramatic, in 1992, when the court reaffirmed Roe, all five justices of the majority had been appointed by Republican presidents. Justice Sandra O'Connor, who had been appointed by President Ronald Reagan, Justice Anthony Kennedy, who had been appointed by President Ronald Reagan, Justice David Souter, who had been appointed by President H. W. Bush, George H.W. Bush, they were joined together by Justice John Paul Stevens, who had been appointed by President Ford, Justice Harry Blackman, who had been appointed by President Nixon. Nonetheless, in Dobbs, the Supreme Court overruled Roe versus Wade. Dobbs involved a Mississippi law that prohibited abortions after the 15th week of pregnancy. Now, the Supreme Court might have ruled narrowly and upheld that law without completely overruling Roe. Six justices voted to uphold the Mississippi law. Five of those six justices voted to overrule Roe versus Wade. Justice Sam Alito wrote the opinion for the court. His opinion was joined by Justices Clarence Thomas and the three Trump appointees, Gorsuch, Kavanaugh, and Barrett. Justice Alito said that Roe versus Wade was, quote, egregiously wrong and exceedingly poorly reasoned. Justice Salito said, precedent deserves little weight in these circumstances. Justice Salito said, a right should be protected under the Constitution only if it's clearly stated in the text, part of the original meaning, or there's a long unbroken tradition. Justice Clarence Thomas, in a concurring opinion, said, now that we've overruled Roe v. Wade, 
we should also overrule Griswold versus Connecticut, the 1965 case that said there's a constitutional right to purchase and use contraceptives. Lawrence versus Texas, the 2002 decision, 2003 decision, where the Supreme Court said states cannot prohibit private consensual same sex activity. And Obergefell versus Hodges, the 2015 case that said states cannot prohibit same sex marriage. Justice Alito, in his majority opinion, said none of those rights are in jeopardy because they don't involve potential life. But if the court is true to what it says, that a right should be safeguarded only if it's in the text of the Constitution or part of the original meaning or a long unbroken tradition, I don't see how any of these rights would continue to be protected by the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court's decision overruling Roe versus Wade has had profound consequences. It is the first time in history that the Supreme Court has ever taken away a major constitutional right. Many states have adopted laws prohibiting most, most all abortions. States like West Virginia, Alabama, Oklahoma now prohibit abortions in the moment of conception except if necessary, to save the life of the pregnant person. Many other states have adopted laws that prohibit abortions after the sixth week of pregnancy, which is often before women know that they're pregnant. Other states have strengthened their protection of abortion rights, like California and New York. The reality is that in states where abortion is illegal, a woman with resources who wants an abortion can travel to her abortion is permitted. Studies came out just this past week that showed the increase in abortions in California and in Massachusetts, in New York, because of people traveling there from states where abortion is illegal. But poor women, pregnant teenagers without resources are again forced to choose face the cruel choice between an unwanted child and an unsafe back alley abortion. Three days later, on Monday, June 27th, the Supreme Court decided Kennedy versus Bremerton schools. Joseph Kennedy was a football coach at a public school in Bremerton in Washington state. He made it a practice of going on to the 50 yard line after games in kneeling and praying, a parent complained. Turned out that players from the team, sometimes players from both teams, would crowd around Coach Kennedy and join him in the prayer. The parents said his son, their family were atheists, but his son felt pressure to join in the prayer for fear that otherwise he wouldn't get as much playing time. The school told Coach Kennedy to stop praying on the field after games. They said, if you need to pray to give thanks afterwards, we'll give you a private space to do that. Coach Kennedy briefly complied. And then he began the practice of going onto the field after games and delivering what he called a Christian inspirational message, a prayer, sometimes joined by players of one team, sometimes both, sometimes people from the stands. The school put Coach Kennedy on administrative leave and gave him a poor performance evaluation. Coach Kennedy sued and said this violated his free exercise of religion and his freedom of speech. The federal district court in the United States Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit ruled against Coach Kennedy. They said that the Supreme Court had held without exception for 60 years that prayer in public schools violates the Establishment Clause of the First Amendment the provision there can be no establishment of religion. The Supreme Court, in a six to three decision, reversed and ruled in favor of Coach Kennedy. Justice Gorsuch wrote for the court. Justice Sotomayor wrote a blistering dissent. Justice Gorsuch said it violated Coach Kennedy's free exercise of religion and free speech to discipline him for praying on the field after games. But what about the Establishment Clause? 
the provision there can be no law respecting the establishment of religion. That's what the lower courts had ruled on. Justice Gorsuch said the test that had been followed for the Establishment Clause since 1971 from Lemon versus Kurtzman was overruled. The court said the new test for the Establishment Clause is that we determine what violates the Establishment Clause by looking at history and original meaning and what the founding fathers intended. That's a direct quote from Justice Gorsuch. We looked at what the founding fathers intended to determine what violates the Constitution. Well, ask yourself this question. What did the framers of the First Amendment think about football coaches in public schools going on the field after games and praying? It's an absurd question. There weren't public schools and there wasn't football. So how are we going to determine the meaning of the Establishment Clause in 2023 just by what the law was in 1791? The question for decades had been, when does prayer in public schools violate the Establishment Clause? And the answer was, virtually always. Now the question is, when is the restriction of prayer an infringement of free exercise religion? Any limit on prayer, by definition, is restricting the free exercise and free speech of those who want to pray. This brings prayer back into the public schools in a way that hasn't been allowed for decades. Three days later, on Thursday, June 30th, the Supreme Court finished its term with a case called West Virginia versus Environmental Protection Agency. The issue, does the Environmental Protection Agency have the authority under the Clean Air Act to regulate greenhouse gas emissions from coal-fired power plants. Turns out that burning coal to run electricity generating utilities produces a great deal of the pollution that's responsible for climate change. So the EPA wanted to restrict these greenhouse gas emissions from coal-fired power plants. West Virginia and some coal companies brought a challenge to this. They lost in the Federal Court of Appeals. But the Supreme Court, in a six to three decision, ruled that the Environmental Protection Agency lacked the authority to impose restrictions on greenhouse gas emissions from coal-fired power plants. The Clean Air Act says that the EPA could regulate pollution from, quote, stationary sources. Obviously, a power plant that generates electricity is a stationary source. So this would seem to fit clearly within the scope of the EPA's authority. It's an enormous crisis confronting the world, how to deal with climate change. But the Supreme Court six to three said the EPA lacks the authority. Chief Justice Roberts wrote for the court and said that when there's a major question of economic and political significance, an agency can act only with clear direction from Congress. Chief Justice Roberts said, whether to give the EPA the authority to regulate greenhouse gas emissions from power plants is a major question of economic or political significance. He said Congress wasn't sufficiently specific here in the authority. This is invalid. Justice Kagan pointed out that the statute is specific. It says the EPA can regulate pollution from stationary sources. Even more, Justice Kagan said, where does this so-called major questions doctrine come from? What is a major question of economic and political significance? What is sufficient congressional guidance? So this is going to open the door to challenges to every kind of government regulation, protect the environment, to safeguard health and safety, to regulate business. I have described for you five cases that came down in a period of nine days from June 21st to June 30th. If you think about these cases, they're ones that affect all of us, often in the most important, the most intimate aspects of our lives. But these were just nine days. Let me talk about the most recent term of the Supreme Court, 
that ended on June 30th of 2023. And here I want to talk about just two days of what the Supreme Court has done. And then from them, I can draw conclusions about what animates this court. On Thursday, June 29th, 2023, the Supreme Court decided students prefer admission versus Harvard College. The issue is, can colleges and universities engage in affirmative action? In 1978, in Regents of the University of California versus Bakke, the United States Supreme Court said that colleges and universities have a compelling interest in having a diverse student body. College universities may use race as one factor in admission decisions to benefit minorities, to enhance diversity, but there can't be quotas or set-asides. Justice Lewis Powell said this in a pivotal opinion. 25 years later, in Grutter versus Bollinger, the Supreme Court reaffirmed this. It was a case that involved the University of Michigan Law School Affirmative Action Program. The Supreme Court, in an opinion by Justice Sandy O'Connor, spoke powerfully about the importance of diversity in the classroom and across the campus. The court reaffirmed college universities race as one factor in their admissions decisions. In 2016, in Fisher versus University of Texas, Austin, the Supreme Court again reaffirmed this. This involved the University of Texas Affirmative Action Program. Well, if the Supreme Court decided the issue just seven years ago, why is it back before the Supreme Court? Did the court find some musty history of the 14th Amendment that led it to believe it made a mistake? Of course not. What's changed is the composition of the Supreme Court. There were three dissenters in the Fisher case, Chief Justice Roberts and Justice Thomas and Alito. And they were joined by three new justices, all appointed by President Trump. Justices Gorsuch, Kavanaugh, and Barrett. And in another six to three decision, the Supreme Court held that no longer can colleges and universities engage in affirmative action. The Supreme Court effectively overruled all of the precedents since 1978, 45 years of decisions that allowed affirmative action. The court was clear, no longer can college universities engage in affirmative action. There were actually two cases before the Supreme Court. One was Students for Admission versus University of North Carolina, and the other was Students for Admission versus Harvard College. Why two cases? Well, equal protection and the 14th Amendment apply only to the government. Private entities, including private schools, don't have to comply with the Constitution. But Title VI of the 1964 Civil Rights Act applies to all recipients of federal funds, public and private. Title VI prohibits recipients of federal funds from discriminating on the basis of race. The Supreme Court has said that the standard under Title VI is the same as the standard under equal protection. And the Supreme Court thus ruled that neither public nor private schools can engage in affirmative action. Justice Sotomayor, in her dissenting opinion, said that this will have, quote, a devastating effect on diversity in colleges and universities. She pointed to the experience of California. In 1996, California voters passed an initiative, Proposition 209, that says that the state in all of its subdivisions, cannot discriminate or give preference on the basis of race or sex in education, contracting, employment. This abolished affirmative action by public schools in California. Justice Sotomayor pointed out that after Proposition 209 was adopted, the number of Black and Latinx students who were freshmen at UCLA and at Berkeley fell by over 50%. For UCLA, it took 19 years to get back to its pre-1996 levels of diversity. It wasn't until 2015. 
Justice Sotomayor points out her dissent, that for UC Berkeley, as recently as 2019, they were not back to the pre-1996 levels of diversity. Over 60% of all selected college universities engage in affirmative action. No longer are they able to do so. The next day, Friday, June 30th, the Supreme Court handed down two important decisions. Both were six to three cases. One was 303 Creative versus Alenis. Colorado has a law that prohibits business establishments from discriminating based on race, sex, religion, sexual orientation. Lori Smith has a business designing websites. She wants to expand her business to design websites for weddings, but she doesn't want to have to design websites for same-sex weddings. She says it would violate her religious beliefs to do so. She went to federal district court in Denver. She wanted the court to declare that it would be unconstitutional to apply the anti-discrimination law against her for not serving same-sex weddings. She wanted an injunction to keep the law from being applied against her. The federal district court and the Federal Court of Appeals ruled against Lori Smith. They said that the state of Colorado has a compelling interest in stopping discrimination based on sexual orientation. The United States Supreme Court, a six to three decision reversed. Justice Gorsuch wrote the opinion for the court. Justice Sinray wrote for the dissenters. The court focused only on Lori Smith's free speech rights. It didn't consider her religious beliefs. And the court said, under the First Amendment, there's a right to not have compelled speech. The court cited a famous case in 1943, West Virginia Board of Education versus Barnett, where the Supreme Court held it violated the First Amendment for West Virginia to force children to salute the flag at the beginning of the school day. Justice Gorsuch said, to force Lori Smith to design websites for same-sex couples against her beliefs would violate the First Amendment. The court said designing a website, writing the content for it is expressive activity. The court said the government can't force people to engage in expressive activity. As Justice Sotomayor said in her dissent, this is the first time in history that the government has ever been kept from prohibiting discrimination on account of the First Amendment. It's the first time in history that the Supreme Court has ever said there's a First Amendment right to violate anti-discrimination laws. And the court's opinion was broad. It says whenever somebody is engaged in expressive activity, they have the right to refuse to provide services that would violate their beliefs. Well, think about it in the context of weddings. There have been cases involving bakers who didn't want to design and bake cakes because of their religious beliefs. Florists who didn't want to make floral arrangements, saying that it's their expressive activity. There have been cases about videographers and photographers who refuse to provide services, saying it's their expressive activity to take pictures. There's a case involving a stationery store. There were a few divide that for same-sex couples. But it's not just about religious beliefs. Any beliefs would be sufficient. The Supreme Court said a person doesn't have to provide services. It would violate their beliefs if they're engaged in expressive activity. It's not just about sexual orientation. Imagine Lori Smith believed that interracial marriage was wrong and refused to serve interracial couples, she would have the same First Amendment right. Maybe I can explain the significance of it in this way. There is always a tension between liberty and equality. Any law that prohibits discrimination limits the freedom to discriminate. But for well over 60 years, the Supreme Court has said that stopping discrimination is more important than protecting freedom to discriminate. 
This case from June 30th of this year is so important because the first time the Supreme Court has ever said that protecting the right to discriminate is more important than stopping discrimination. Another case came down on June 30th, Biden versus Nebraska. There's a federal law, the HEROES Act, that says that the Secretary of Education can, quote, waive or modify student loan obligations in an emergency. It is this statute that President Trump invoked to say that he was suspending the obligation to repay student loans during the pandemic. President Biden continued it. And then he made it permanent. President Biden gave $43 million, sorry, 43 million Americans student loan relief, giving them up to $20,000 of assistance relief. Here, Nebraska and five other states brought a challenge against this. And the Supreme Court, again in a six to three decision, ruled that Biden lacked the authority to do so. The court invoked the major questions doctrine, what I had talked about from a year before in West Virginia versus EPA. Chief Justice Roberts said, whether to give such student loan relief, it's a major question of economic or political significance. So it's much debated in Congress, there's no consensus. Therefore, for the administrative agency, the Secretary of Education to do this violated the law. But as Justice Kagan pointed out in a dissent, one of those basic principles of law is that when the words of the statute are clear, they need to be followed. Here, the words of the statute seem clear. The Secretary of Education can waive student loan obligations. What's clearer is a waiver than what Biden had done? Well, I have covered eight Supreme Court decisions. They came down between June 21st of 2022 and June 30th of 2023. In all eight of these cases, there was a six to three ruling. Dobbs, we might say, was five to four to overrule Roe, but it was six to three to uphold the Mississippi law. All the others were six three. Every one of these cases had a majority of Roberts, Thomas, Alito, Gorsuch, Kavanaugh, and Barrett. So what does this tell us about the current court? I think it's a court that is very much animated by a conservative political agenda. It's not a court that's engaged in judicial restraint. We think of judicial restraint as the following precedent. But here, precedent has been regularly overruled, like in the affirmative action case, like in the abortion case. It's not a court that's deferring to the other branches of government. It's not a court that's deferring to its predecessor justices with regard to precedent. This is a court that is very aggressively changing the law in a conservative direction. I think what animates this court is the current conservative political agenda. Conservatives long have wanted to overrule Roe versus Wade, to limit gun regulation, to end affirmative action, and so on. And the Supreme Court, in short order, nine days over the end of June 22, two days over the end of June 23, have been able to succeed in exactly what they want dramatically advancing the conservative political agenda. Well, this brings me to the third and final part of my remarks, and that's what does the future hold? I think in answering this question, it's important to look at the ages of the justices. If you look at the six conservative justices, when the court resumes on the first Monday of October in just a couple of weeks, Clarence Thomas will be the oldest at age 75. Samuel Lito will be 73. John Roberts will be 68. And the three Trump appointees are all still in their 50s. But Kavanaugh will be 58. Neil Gorsuch, 56. And Amy Coney Barrett, 51. In case you're interested relative to the liberal justices, 
Sonia Sotomayor is 69, Elena Kagan is 63, and Katanji Brown Jackson is 53. I have long thought that the best predictor of a long lifespan is being confirmed for a seat on the United States Supreme Court. John Paul Stevens didn't retire until he was 90 years old. Ruth Bader Ginsburg stayed on the court until she died at age 87. Well, if Clarence Thomas remains till he's 90, he could be there another 15 years. Or to think of it another way, Amy Coney Barrett was 48 when she was confirmed for the court back in 2020. If she remains on the court until she's 87, the age Justice Ginsburg when she died, Barrett will be a justice into the year 2059. So it seems to me quite likely that we are going to have a solid conservative majority for many years to come. And I would expect if there's a Republican president in 2024 and a Republican Senate, Clarence Thomas and maybe Samuel Alito will consider resigning then so that that president can pick even much younger justices to keep the Republican control of the Supreme Court for years, if not decades to come. There are proposals for reforming the Supreme Court. Let me talk about three of those proposals. One proposal would be an ethics code for the Supreme Court. I cannot speak forcefully enough about the need for an ethics code for the Supreme Court. All judges in the United States, state and federal, are governed by an ethics code, except for the most important judges in the country, United States Supreme Court justices. There is no ethics code for the Supreme Court justices. Whether a justice is disqualified from a case is left entirely to that justice. We've seen the consequences of there not being an ethics code for the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court has its lowest approval ratings in history. A Quinnipiac University poll in June of 2020 had only 30% expressing approval from the Supreme Court's performance and 59% expressing disapproval. A Gallup poll had only 20% of the American people expressing confidence in the Supreme Court. I regularly speak at judges' conferences. Last Thursday, I spoke at a federal judges' conference. This past Sunday, I spoke at a state judges' conference. What I've seen is that the people who most believe that there should be an ethics code for Supreme Court justices are judges, federal and state. They're all governed by an ethics code. The American Bar Association promulgated the model code of judicial conduct. And that's what most states have based the judicial ethics code on. It would be very easy to take that and apply that to the United States Supreme Court. There have been major ethical violations reported by justices, such as Justice Thomas and Justice Alito. And yet still, the Supreme Court lacks an ethics code. I would hope that the court would adopt an ethics code on its own. I think the absence of an ethics code is a self-inflicted wound for the Supreme Court. And yet, still, they have not done it. If the justices don't create their own ethics code, I would hope Congress would pass a law requiring them to do so. A bill to do this passed the Senate Judiciary Committee about a month ago by a 12 to 11 margin. Every Democratic senator on the Senate Judiciary Committee voted for it. Every Republican voted against it. But ethics should not be a partisan issue. The fact that the recent ethical improprieties involve conservative justices doesn't mean that ethics is a partisan issue. I would hope that if the Supreme Court doesn't adopt an ethics code, Congress will require that it do so. Congress already controls many aspects of the Supreme Court. There are already some disclosure laws for Supreme Court justices. Also, Congress sets the budget of the Supreme Court. It sets the salary of Supreme Court justices. And so I think it's completely appropriate for Congress to say to the Supreme Court, you have to adopt an ethics code. But I think the credibility of the Supreme Court, and therefore the legitimacy of all courts, is tarnished without an ethics code. A second proposal for Supreme Court reform is term limits for Supreme Court justices. 
I favor term limits. I have long argued for 18-year non-renewable terms for Supreme Court justices. Why 18? Well, in part, it's because 18 is divisible by nine, the number of justices, and it would then mean a vacancy every two years. Every president would get an equal ability to influence the composition of the Supreme Court. I think term limits would be a terrific idea, in part because it's thankfully life expectancy is a lot longer today than it was in 1787. Average life expectancy in 1787 was 37 years old. Between 1787, when the Constitution was ratified, and 1970, the average tenure of a Supreme Court justice was 15 years, and it remained remarkably constant over all this time. But for the justice who appointed since 1970, who have left the bench, the average tenure has been 27 years. And it's estimated that the course of this century will go up that the average tenure of a Supreme Court justice is over 35 years. That's too much power in one person's hands for too long a period of time. That's why I favor 18-year non-renewable terms. Also, as I said earlier, too much now depends on the accident of history as to when vacancies occur. Richard Nixon got to fill four seats in his first two years as president. Jimmy Carter had no seats to fill in his four years as president. 18-year non-renewable terms would give every president the equal ability to influence the composition of the Supreme Court. But I think term limits likely would take a constitutional amendment. Article 3, Section 1 of the Constitution says that Supreme Court justices have their positions for life. They have their positions of good behavior. I think for Congress to take that away from justices would violate the Constitution. Would then, if it's a constitutional amendment, the question would be, is there a constituency that cares enough to do the huge work that's necessary for a constitutional amendment? I think there's bipartisan support for term limits. Texas Governor Rick Perry, when he was running for president, called for term limits. In fact, he also asked for 18-year term limits for Supreme Court justices. But I still worry, is there a constituency that cares enough to do the hard work in order to bring about a constitutional amendment? A third proposal for reform is to increase the size of the Supreme Court. The Constitution says nothing about the size of the Supreme Court. The size of the Supreme Court is prescribed by federal statutes. The number of justices over the course of American history is way between five and 10. Nine is a historic accident. In the late 1860s, there was a terribly unpopular president, Andrew Johnson. He was from Tennessee, and he found himself a Southerner presiding over Reconstruction that he opposed. Johnson was very unpopular. The House of Representatives voted to impeach him. It was just one vote short of conviction in the Senate. Well, Congress wanted to make sure that Andrew Johnson didn't get to fill a seat on the Supreme Court. So Congress passed a law saying the next time there's a vacancy on the Supreme Court, it will remain open. The seat will be eliminated. And that's how we got to nine. But there's nothing magical about nine. Congress could increase the number of justices. It would take a federal statute. I don't see it as likely in the foreseeable future that Congress would do this. After all, Senate Republicans would surely filibuster, having increased in the size of the Supreme Court when there's a Democrat president, and Democratic senators would filibuster if a Republican Senate was trying to do this. At this point in time, it's a Republican House, so they won't vote to increase the size of the Supreme Court. There's a danger to increasing the size of the Supreme Court. It could create endless expansions. If the Democrats were to do it now with a Democratic president and Democratic Senate, Nothing could stop the Republicans from doing it when they were in control and then back to the Democrats, and it would be unwieldy. But it's certainly something that needs to be considered. Those are the three major reforms that I can identify with regard to the Supreme Court. I teach constitutional law 
teach it both to undergraduates and law students. And I've never seen some of my students as they discourage now about the Supreme Court and about constitutional law. And what I try to tell them to give them hope is that if you look at the entire sweep of American history, there's been great advances in freedom and equality. Think about race. There's a long way to go for our society with regard to racial justice. But if you compare it to the past, undoubtedly there's been progress. The Constitution is written in 1787, institutionalized slavery. And from 1787 to 1865, a period of 78 years, the Supreme Court protected the rights of slave owners and never ruled in favor of enslaved people. From 1896 to 1954, the Supreme Court upheld separate but equal, even though separate never was equal. When I was born in 1953, there were laws in every Southern state, in Southern parts of many Northern states, that required separation of the races in all aspects of life. So there's been progress with regard to race. There's a long way to go. We say the same thing with regard to sex. When I went to law school in 1970, only 5% of the students were women. When I started the law school there in 1975, just 25% of the students are women. Today at Berkeley Law, 63% of our students are women. Or think about it in terms of gay and lesbian rights. It wasn't until 2015 that the Supreme Court first said the laws that prohibit same-sex marriage you're focusing on state laws, violate the Constitution. I think that the late Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. got it exactly right when he said, the arc of the moral universe is long and it bends towards justice. And what I try to tell my students is that justice will only happen if they, if we all work for it. So thank you so much. And I'm glad to shift to your questions. Thank you very much, Professor Chemerinsky. Um, please ask your questions. You can raise your hand and I will recognize you or you can just speak up. I will also be looking in chat. Um, and please keep your uh, questions uh, very focused and brief. So we want to give everybody a chance, uh, as many people uh, as possible, to ask a question. I believe somebody called S has raised uh, a hand. So please go ahead, S. Yes, go ahead. No? All right. Uh, anybody else with a question or a comment? Um, I was just going like, um, just like California laws are more lingering and stuff like that. And then I was like, um, so, cause I seen like the abortion laws are different from like down south, like Alabama, Virginia, Oklahoma. But he was like, California and New York is like more, I guess, protected where people can just get abortions. The Supreme Court has said that the issue of abortion is left to each state. Mm -hmm. So some states have prohibited all abortions or almost all. Some allow abortions like California. The Supreme mm -hmm. Court said there's no constitutional right to abortion. So it's left to each state to decide. Thank you. Um, go ahead. I not I can't see who has raised his or her hand. So please just unmute yourself and ask a question. Um, okay, I wondered, you know, in the Declaration of Independence, it said there are inalienable rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. I guess that's in the Declaration, not in the Constitution. But I wonder, do judges, you know, at whatever level, ever take particularly the issue of the pursuit of happiness into account? And, you know, it seems to me in in recently with the issues about marriage and sexuality, particularly, that um, a person, unless they can choose their sexuality or um, or whom they marry, how can they be happy? So, uh, 
in particular, I'm wondering with textualists, uh, do they consider the pursuit of happiness a, rele a relevant right? <laughs> no, the Declaration of Independence isn't regarded as a legally enforceable document. The Constitution is. So the language in the Declaration of Independence about life, liberty, pursuit of happiness is just rhetorical. There's no Supreme Court cases that have ever said there's a right to pursue happiness. The Supreme Court decisions about marriage equality for gays and lesbians focused on the liberty under the Due Process Clause. Now, it includes a right to marry. They focused on laws that prohibit same-sex marriage, discriminate against gays and lesbians, but it's not at all about the pursuit of happiness. Because it seemed to me, from what I hear, textualists, they're always talking about what was happening in, you know, at the time the Constitution was ratified. And it would seem like, you know, the same people who wrote the Declaration signed the Constitution so that that would indicate what they were thinking at the time. Um, the, the textualists focus on the text of the Constitution. Some of those who drafted the Constitution had been part of the Declaration of Independence. But keep in mind, the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution were basically 20 years apart. And um, so I don't think that you would find the so any justice who would say there's a right to pursuit of happiness based on the Declaration of Independence. You can find <laughs> rights in other places. You can certainly find rights under the liberty of the due process clause, like the right to same-sex marriage, but I don't think the court's gonna say there's a right to pursue happiness based on the Declaration of Independence. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Christina, please go ahead. Hi, good afternoon. Um, I work with the Community and Academic Relations Department, um, and I just wanted to thank you, Dean Chemerinsky, for taking the time to come speak to our students here at Santa Monica College. Um, I'm sure some of the students here are interested in going to uh, law school after transferring. Um, so I was just wondering, what are some creative methods that law schools are exploring to advance the goal of getting students of color in law school? I know um, UC Irvine has the POP program, which um, I participated a couple years back ago. So I was just wondering if you have any other um, programs that you could share with our students. Sure. Um, it's very important that law schools create pipeline programs. And these include, you refer to the POP program, it's a pre-law outreach program that the University of California Irvine does for students from disadvantaged backgrounds. Many law schools, including Berkeley and Irvine, have programs for high school students. At Irvine, we created the Saturday Academy of Law. This involves a relationship to the Santa Ana Garden Grove, and Anaheim schools, which is a school population, probably over 95% Latinx students. And we run a program, or at least when I was there, and I assume they still do, 50 students in the fall and 50 more students in the spring. For each, it's a six-week program. And it's an enormously successful program. Um, and we have pipeline programs here. Other law schools do. We engage very aggressively in outreach to students to apply and then recruitment of students to come. Thank you. Um, Kevin has a comment and a question. Um, if I could summarize, uh, how can we assemble a national constituency for ethics if there is no grassroots outrage at the local level? I hope there is an outrage at the local level to the lack of ethics for Supreme Court justices. I certainly hear it when I speak to audiences both liberal and conservative. And I think we need to keep up the drumbeat of, it is unacceptable that all judges in the country have to follow an ethics code, except for the most important judges, United States Supreme Court justices. And so whatever organizations we're part of that care about these issues need to make our voices heard and put pressure on the Supreme Court to create an ethics code. Thank you. Ariana, please go ahead. Um, hi, I would like to say that um, it was a very engaging lecture. And at the end, you talked about how there is still hope for um, change to be made. 
However, I want to know if there are any like laws or any rulings that might be targeted in the future by the Supreme Court that like people should know about, you know, and like um, regarding like sexual orientation, race or any like discrimination laws that will mm -hmm. might be targeted in the future. Well, many states have adopted laws that discriminate against transgender students. Um, there are laws that say that students who are transgender can't participate in a scholastic athletics that correspond to their gender identity. There are schools that say that transgender students can't use the restrooms that correspond to their gender identity. There are laws that have been adopted in states that prohibit gender affirming care for transgender children. I think these are very important civil rights issues that will be coming to the Supreme Court. And I would hope that the Supreme Court would follow what it said in other cases and provide protection for transgender individuals. Thank you. There's a question, there's a comment and a question in the chat, if I could summarize. Um, the claim has been made that many European democracies approach rights in a soft manner, aspiring to balance between conflicting parties, whereas the US approaches rights in an all or none manner. Do you agree or disagree? And how I can disagree. the US Okay. I and how can the And how can the US improve our approach to constitutional rights? Thank you. Um putting aside the Second Amendment and the approach the court took there, no rights are absolute under the Constitution. The government can infringe basic rights, even discriminate based on race, if it has compelling interest in no other way to achieve it. For some types of discrimination or some rights, there's less of a burden on the government. It only has to show an important interest and that its action is substantially related to it. And for many kinds of rights, the government just has to have a legitimate interest and the action has to be reasonable. Well, that's about balancing the rights. It's just how we arrange the weights on the scale. If it's race discrimination, the government's going to need to come up with a really compelling reason in other way to achieve it. If it's an economic regulation, then it just has to be legitimate and there has to be reasonable. To me, this is all of balancing. It's just the vocabulary we use with regard to balancing. I think the most important thing with regard to our rights is who's on the Supreme Court. And presidential elections matter. If you disagree with the decisions that I mentioned today, all of them are because Donald Trump beat Hillary Clinton in 2016. And so who's president determines who's on the Supreme Court and all of the federal courts. I think it's important for all of us to get involved in organizations that exist to fight for our rights because we can be much more effective working collectively than we can as individuals. Thank you. Uh, Susan? Yeah, I appreciate so much um, all that you told us as, as distressing and disturbing as it is. And I appreciate that you offered some hope there um, for students and for us. Um, I'm wondering if you could comment on the limits on free speech that are acceptable. The ACLU recently had a, a an opinion piece about um, in relationship to Trump's argument that he's exercising his rights to free speech. And I wonder if you could comment on all of the uh, uh, discussion around that. Um, and um, uh, the other issue I'm interested in is this challenge to his right to be on the ballot. So I don't know if you have time to talk about that. Sure. Let me deal with the latter first and then I can deal with the former. Section three of the 14th Amendment says that for those who've taken an oath of office, if they participate in a rebellion or insurrection, they are forever precluded from holding federal office. And the argument is being made now, you know, lawsuit filed in Colorado last week, other lawsuits are being filed around the country, that since Trump participated in, in some ways even led the insurrection on January 6th, he is no longer qualified to be on the ballot. Um, I think there's a strong argument that Trump is disqualified based on this, um, an a, article was written, and you can find it online, by William Bowd and Michael Paulson. They're two conservative law professors 
bowed at University of Chicago, Paulson at St. Thomas Law School. They're Federalist Society members. And they said that Trump is disqualified based on Section 3 of the 14th Amendment. And they said it's not even a close question. Lawrence Tribe, a liberal Harvard law professor, and Michael Ludig, a conservative former federal court appeals judge, wrote an article in The Atlantic saying the exact same thing. Well, when you've got conservatives saying this, it's really an argument that we have to take seriously. Um, as to the former question that you asked, um, free speech is never absolute. There's no right to use your speech to commit a crime. You can't go into a bank and hand the teller a note saying, your money or I blow up the building and then defend just by saying, well, I was only engaging in free speech. An employer can't say to an employee, sleep with me, you're fired. And the defense then being, oh, it was just free speech. Speech doesn't extend that far. And I think there's a strong argument that what Donald Trump did, such as in Georgia where he's been indicted, or what he's been indicted for in DC, was using speech to commit crimes. But that's not protected by the First Amendment. Thank you. I just wanted to remind everyone of the note that uh, Christina has put, reminding all of us, including our students, that our college hosts, uh, nurtures a law pathway program for SMC students. So please look into that. It's in chat. Um, there's a link that Christina has provided, and her office has provided the logistical support for all these events. So thank you very much for that support. Um, I just have one quick question. I, I don't know if it can be answered, but uh, as you know, uh, there is this great uh, debate between the living constitution that evolves uh, versus you know the originalist literal interpretation. Uh, so you want to comment on that a little bit more? I think there has to be a living constitution. Otherwise, it makes no sense for us to be governed by a constitution that was written in the late 18th century for an agrarian slave society. In fact, it was Chief Justice John Marshall in 1819 who said, quote, we must never forget that it's a constitution works bounding, constitution meant to be adapted and endure for ages to come. I wrote a book that came out last year titled Worse Than Nothing, The Dangerous Fallacy of Originalism, the details why originalism be a terrible way to approach the Constitution. Under it, Brown versus Board of Education was wrongly decided. It's the same Congress that voted to ratify the 14th Amendment, segregated the District of Columbia public schools. Under it, Loving versus Virginia, that said that states can't prohibit interracial marriage was wrongly decided. Under it, Obergefell versus Hodges, that said that gays and lesbians have the right to marry was wrongly decided. But when you think about the issues that come before the court, can there be restraining orders? Can, uh, can there be laws that prevent those with restraining orders, domestic violence case from having guns? Can a school prevent a high school football coach from praying on the field? It makes no sense to answer those questions just based on what people thought in 1787 or 1791. Thank you. Uh, we have time for one last question. Ariana, go ahead. Um, I was wondering what an ethics code for the Supreme Court would entail. I'm not a law student, and so I'm just really, uh, I'm just really curious about what that would mean. There is an ethics, it... there is an ethics code for all other judges. It's based on something the American Bar Association has promulgated called the Model Code of Judicial Conduct, and it regulates things like conflict of interest. When does there have to be disclosure? When does there have to be disqualification of a judge because of financial interest or the interests of family members? What kind of behavior by judges off the bench is acceptable? What kind of behavior by judges off the, on the bench is acceptable? The Code of Ethics governs all of that. But we don't need to reinvent the wheel. We can just take the Code of Ethics that applies to all other judges and apply it to Supreme Court justices. Thank you so much for having me. Truly my pleasure to be with you and happy Constitution Day. Thank you very much, Irvin Chemerinsky, uh, a true teacher. You've given us facts. You've given us a lot to think about and it's the start of the conversation. That's what we want teachers to do. Thank to you. To Thank you so much. Thank you and take care. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for coming. Thank you, Hari. Wonderful. Beautiful. Thank you.
Thank you.